Welcome to the Board Game Marketing Podcast. Let's cue the intro. This is the number one podcast to learn marketing strategies for your board game. Whether you're just starting on your first game or an experienced designer, you've come to the right place. My name is Nalin, and let's talk marketing for your game. Everyone. Welcome to the Board Game Marketing Podcast. Today, we are lucky to have Evangelos on the show. He is a serial Kickstarter, and I'm really, really excited for everything that he has to share with us today. So, Evangelos, welcome to the show. Hello. Nice to meet you, Nalin, and uh, hello to everybody listening to this. Awesome. So, firstly, you know, I'd really love if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and also about you know, some of the projects that you uh, run before, before we get into the nitty-gritty details about marketing. Yeah, I would love to, to do that. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Evangelos, Evangelos Foskolos. Uh, I am from Greece. Uh, the company that uh, I'm running with a couple of my friends is uh, called Draw Lab Entertainment. And uh, for the last six years, we have been uh, doing Kickstarter campaigns about our uh, games, board games, uh, and our board game accessories that we do. So uh, we're not only making uh, board games, but we are also manufacturing and kickstarting board game accessories, which is a little bit of a, a different animal to, to, to do on Kickstarter. Um, and everything uh, needs a little bit of a different approach uh, campaign-wise. Uh, so far, we have done uh, more than 10 campaigns. I think our most successful ones are for our uh, legendary metal coins. We have done uh, five campaigns uh, so far. We do one every year. Uh, we usually have around 1,000 backers every year. And uh, the most exciting thing is that they are uh, return backers as well, which is something I'm really happy about. Um, and uh, game-wise, I think our most successful game that we have kick-started is uh, probably Mystic Scrolls, which we are still repeating, even though it is like uh, three years old, but we keep making new editions in different languages and it's going great for us. Uh, and the most successful game that we have made outside of Kickstarter is uh, When I Dream, which is now uh, being uh, licensed by Repos Productions, which is doing... Uh, very well, and I'm really excited about this too. So I'm very happy to be working in uh, in the industry, both on Kickstarter and outside Kickstarter. I think uh, every approach has its own merits and its own flaws. So I'm really happy to to talk about it and about uh, the marketing aspects of every project that we have done so far. That's yeah, that's incredible that you've launched so many campaigns, both board games and accessories, and you're doing stuff off of crowdfunding too. So there's a lot of things that you're you're doing at the same time, which is great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, we are a team of uh, five people now, so we we have the manpower to do a lot of things at the same time, and because we have a lot of ideas and a lot of uh, ex- projects that we're really excited about, I'm very glad that we we can do so many. Nice. So. <laughs> I know you mentioned that you run, you know, these legendary metal coin campaigns uh, every year for the past few years now. And you were talking about um, your past, you know, uh, backers coming back again and again and again with you. I'd love to understand kind of what marketing would you do to prepare for your campaign during the pre-launch stage, especially for people who have backed your previous campaign. Yeah, I would love to do that. Uh, the, the number one reason is that uh, you have to treat uh, your backers well in order for them to return. So what we always try to do is uh, we uh, under-promise and over-deliver. So we always schedule the delivery date at least three months away from the date that we think that we are going to deliver uh, our campaign. So we always are either early or at least in time of what we have set up. And of course, updating our backers regularly is really important because uh, people not only need to to know that their uh, games are coming, but they also want to know what, how how it's progressing, if there are going to be any delays, if you can show anything behind the behind the scenes. So we try to to give as much information about that as possible. And uh, the other thing that we do for uh, the backers of the coins especially is that we always do some kind of poll or we ask our backers in different ways about what other coins or what other accessories 
uh, do they want to see from us or how do they use them so that we can get ideas from them and try to tailor something new uh, according to their needs. So, of course, if you have treated your uh, backers well and uh, if you make something that they have asked you to make, uh, there is a very high return that they will come back to support you. So everybody wins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds really awesome about setting expectations, you know, and, and giving those frequent updates and also incorporating your backers into your new campaign. So they feel like they're part, they're involved in, in what you're creating. Exactly, yeah. And uh, we also do this uh, during the campaign as well. Uh, for example, in the current campaign, we... Uh, we had a stretch goal that uh, the backers were going to uh, give us a suggestion of a new coin set that they're going, they, want, they wanted us to make. We had like 20 different uh, suggestions or more. And we made a poll and the winner of the poll is the coin that we, dis- we made at the end of the campaign. So we created a new Celtic Gaelic coin set, especially after our backer suggestion and voting. So we really t- try to take uh, our backers' feedback uh, very se- seriously. Yeah, yeah, that that's really cool that you guys incorporate that for that for that campaign so that people can vote and to see exactly what they voted for come to life. In in terms of kind of like the production side of it, how did you balance, you know, taking in your backers input with understanding the cost of what you had to do for the campaign? Uh for the coins especially it's uh, it's easier because we are also the manufacturers of them. So we pretty much know how much um, it is going to cost us depending on how uh, big the coin is going to be, how heavy the coins are going to be, what colors the coins are going to have. So we have some parameters beforehand that we can uh, fill according to our backers' needs. Also, uh, we take from all the suggestions that we have from our backers, we, we do some curating. Uh, for example, if somebody asks us to make, I don't know, a, a Warhammer coin, we cannot like uh, make a coin for somebody else's uh, IP. So we only uh, put up to voting coin sets that we can create uh, with our own designs. So they give us a suggestion. We discuss it with our uh, artists. We give them like a couple of weeks to come up with the initial designs. So when the campaign is ending, we are announcing how they're going to look. So everybody knows exactly what they're going to get. And then we have a time, uh, we have, we already have taken the time to calculate the cost to make sure that we are in budget. And we also have a a very good idea of what we're going to offer to the buckets. So before the campaign has ended, uh, both the buckets know 90% of what they're going to get. And we do know how much is going to cost. Uh, If we were going to do it with a board game, it would need to be much better organized because we are not the manufacturers of our games. Uh, We make them in China. So uh, in similar cases, when, for example, we have asked our backers for uh, an extra character in a game, um, we have already asked them about extra cost. If we hit that stretch goal, how much this is going to cost us? Uh, If we hit that stretch goal, how much this is going to cost us? Uh, what are the boundaries in which we can uh, um, promise something so that we can be certain that we're going to be able to make it with the cost that we already have. So it's all about uh, being uh, prepared and uh, plan ahead. Wow. Yeah. I I love that you talked about both from the side where you're the manufacturing of the coins yourself. So it's easier for you to understand the cost, understand the planning process and having a game where the manufacturer is done elsewhere and you have yeah. to get ahead even before you launch and what kind of stretch goals, if any, and the cost for that. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I assume that the most of our, the, the most of the listeners are going to be publishers that do not have the means to manufacture the games themselves. So I, I can't stress enough how important it is to have uh, got in touch with a manufacturer that you're going to use, have a code beforehand, but also have a code in case things are going to do uh, okay enough for you to fund, like uh, it, it's amazing, not just okay. If you do great and you do fund the game uh, to have the cost beforehand, but it's always good to be prepared in case to to be very successful and have a lot of stretch goals so that you don't uh, be caught in, in surprise and uh, from something very expensive to make or make something much heavier and have extra costs by shipping 
something much heavier than you, what you have planned for. So it's always good to ask a lot of questions to, to your manufacturer. Yeah, love it. The more questions, the better. <laughs> yeah, you need all the information you can get. All the data is invaluable. Yeah, absolutely. So I know we just kind of got a little bit ahead of ourselves here. I wanted to kind of really focus on the pre-launch stage again, because you, you mentioned a lot of really cool things that you guys did, <clears throat> setting expectations, doing updates, and also kind of incorporating backers from the previous games into your new one. Can you talk more a little bit about what else you did during the pre-launch stage to get all these people ready for your crowdfunding campaign? Uh, well, we do have uh, a newsletter list, which is uh, very important. We try to send messages to our uh, followers uh, at least every month, but uh, no more than four times every month. So we don't want to spam them, spam them, but we don't want them to forget who we are. So we try to send uh, one newsletter every week or every couple of weeks. Um, we also have uh, a quite active uh, social media presence. We do have our Facebook group, our Facebook uh, page, our Facebook group, our uh, Instagram page, uh, our Twitter. So we try to post regularly about one of our products every couple of days in the social media or if we are running a campaign, we try to post something every day uh, or in Instagram, a couple or three different images every day. So uh, it's important to keep engaging to the to the backers that you already had because they are now your customers and you want to help them not only uh, remind, remember who you are, but why they backed you in the first place, what was um, that made them excited about your game or your product, what, uh, uh, why they should uh, care about what you have to offer next. So it's important to show your brand, but also yourself. And uh, you can do this, of course, uh, through the various Facebook groups uh, like Board Game Spotlights, Board Game Exposure, all the popular board game groups. So it's good to post uh, about your games there regularly, but also post about games in general because nobody wants to hear about somebody talking about his stuff all the time. So you want to provide content uh, on your social media in various ways. Yeah, I really like that you talk about posting about the game and also posting about yourself because I, I find that a lot of people forget to just talk about themselves too because people love knowing designers. People love knowing who is the person behind the game too. Exactly, yeah. And uh, it gives a more uh, personal touch. Uh, I mean, I don't want somebody to get my games bef just before because they like me. I mean, I would appreciate that. <laughs> but uh, it's not only that we try to... Uh, to make good games, but uh, we also want to show that uh, we try, that we are invested to to good games. So if people see that we care about how a board game, a good, what makes a board game good, uh, it means that maybe our games are also good because we care about it. So it shows you some extra empathy, and it shows you, shows you, of course, that there is a human on the other side of the screen. Yeah, like really that trust and that credibility building factor, just by talking about yourself. I, I love that you guys are you guys are doing that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's. Uh, it's very important. And uh, of course, uh, if you get used to it, it becomes a little bit natural. So you can enjoy it as well if you do it uh, a lot. So I, I enjoy a lot of my uh, interactions on social media because, after all, I love talking about games. So if I talk about games, whether they are mine or somebody else's, I'm, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so with all these channels, you have your group on Facebook, your page, your Twitter, your Instagram, your emails. Can you tell us more about what you do, I guess, the few weeks before your campaign launch, just to get everyone ready to, you know, uh, for your new campaign? Uh, yeah, we, we do have uh, quite a list, actually, so that we try to check every point. Uh, of course, you have to have your Kickstarter page ready. So uh, you may not have all the visuals or may, maybe not all the reviewers have uh, returned with their uh, video review or, or anything. But uh, you certainly have a cover image that you want to post everywhere before you launch. Uh, you probably have a video at one or two weeks before the campaign, which is also great to share around. Um, you want to have your audience know about the game that it's coming 
a few months before. So you have sent your newsletter, you have posted on social media from your page and from your profile. Um, we also do some uh, pre-marketing advertising as well. So we do post uh, some uh, Facebook ads mostly uh, for at least a couple of weeks before the campaign uh, launches uh, in order to generate traffic and uh, to get some newsletter subscriptions as well. Uh, and we try to be engaged in uh, discussions about similar games. For example, if somebody, if we make, uh, I don't know, a worker placement game and somebody is posting about a popular worker placement game and people are discussing about other uh, games similar to that in uh, in that thread, maybe it's a good time for you to jump in and mention your game casually. I mean, not force it, but if it comes through the flow of the discussion, it's always good to do it uh, yourself because nobody else is going to do it before they know the game exists. Uh, of course, all the uh, content creators maybe have already posted something about your game maybe when they received it, maybe one of the reviews is already out. So if that happens, you do want to uh, share that content, engage with their, their audience, because if uh, a content creator posts a, a video review about your game, uh, then their audience is going to see it. So maybe it's a very good time to get in touch with that audience and ask them about uh, what they like about it. Uh, so we try to do a little bit of everything, I guess. <laughs> wow, yeah, that's that's definitely a lot. You mentioned everything from ads to just engaging audiences, talk about similar games and talking to reviewers and their audience. So that's, uh, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg of what you guys are doing here. Yeah. I mean, uh, you don't want to be pussy and uh, salesy in every different uh, social media interaction that you have. But on the other side, you do want uh, people to know about your game at least a couple of weeks before it comes. Uh, in my book, if uh, you're, Kickstarter campaign comes out, everybody has to know that it's there. I mean, uh, maybe they have just seen a picture uh, on Instagram before. Maybe they have just seen, um, I don't know, maybe a poll about the exciting games that are coming or somebody mentions it on a list about games that are coming soon on Kickstarter. Uh, you do want everybody to have at least seen an image or heard the name of the game before they see it on Kickstarter. So, it's much more important for me to see that uh, the X game is uh, live now and I have seen about a couple of times before, even though I don't remember exactly what it is, but I know it is something that I have heard about, so maybe I'm more interested to hear what it is than if than if it's uh, just another game on Kickstarter. Yeah, I, I like that you talk about that too, because a lot of people forget that um, people need about seven exposures to one thing before they actually consider buying. So the, the fact that you said that you want people to at least have seen it so that they're kind of starting to consider it is, is really great to hear. Yeah. And uh, I know that uh, the easy and expensive way is to do it through Facebook ads, but if you can do it organically, which can be done, it's also really great. Uh, the other quite expensive way to do it, at least in a, a non uh, COVID-19 world is uh, through conventions. Um, if you go to, it's a, if you go to conventions, uh, you can have your banner there. You can have people playing the game there. So the people that play the game there are your best audience. You can ask them for the email to give them updates. You can ask them about their feedback that you can use in order to improve the game. But also if you have a presence there and you have, you have a chance to show the game in a lot of people. So maybe you can redirect people that went to that convention, to your page, to your Facebook uh, page, or your website after the convention is over. So uh, conventions are also a great way to get audience. Not that many people, but you can you have a chance that uh, every player who plays the game there is uh, can be a backer. Yeah, yeah, that that's definitely true for the the post COVID world, like you mentioned, where yeah, you can talk directly to people and have them experience the game, and just even you know, like you said, ask for their email or ask to keep in touch somehow. Yeah, exactly. So I wanted to kind of go back to reviewers a little bit. I've had a lot of people ask me about this. Um, how far ahead do you typically contact reviewers before you release a game? 
Um, uh, this is this is gonna be tricky because uh, the more popular reviewers and the most popular uh, Facebook groups have already uh, signed off their time for the next two or three months. A lot of times, so what I what I try to do ideally is get in touch with them at least six months ahead to let them know that I have something uh, in September that I want to to reserve a slot for to have a review or to have uh, the banner of the Facebook group reserved. Um, what, um, so I try to set up a date ahead of time and then try to reach that date. Uh, usually I try to schedule this. I, if I think that I can be ready in September, I will try to reserve the slot and run the campaign in October so that I have uh, enough time for things to go wrong. Um, but sometimes if we haven't prepared or if uh, everything comes uh, faster in development, uh, I have gotten in touch with somebody to review my game like a month ago. Uh, it doesn't always work, but you can even find like uh, last, uh, last time spaces available sometime. But I would recommend to go and read somebody at least four to six months before the campaign launches. Wow, yeah, that's that's definitely a lot of planning um, to do for to to get it four to six months ahead. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you do have a lot of preparation to do. So you, <laughs> especially from us, that uh, we have to ship things usually from Greece to the US. Uh, we know that uh, a parcel will take ten days to say. To, to be sure, so we schedule like 20 days. So we know that we have to have prototype copies like in four months. So we have four months to develop the game and make it perfect from the day that we set the, the final date of the campaign. So uh, if you have hard dates, it helps you plan everything ahead smoothly, I think, as well. Got it. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So you've done... a You've talked a lot about pre-launch, about conventions, about you know getting those multiple exposures, reviews, and and so many things. So when it comes to kind of the campaign, what happens on launch day for marketing? Uh, well, on launch day, uh, you're going to stay on your laptop for the next twenty four hours. I mean, yes. <laughs> so what I what I try to do is uh, before the campaign launch uh, goes live. Of course, I have double-checked everything. I have prepared some links so that I can track them through the, the different uh, Google Analytics that we use. Uh, so you have set up the different links to, for every different uh, channel or reviewer or uh, social media channel that you use so that you can see where you got your traffic from after the campaign to plan for the next one. Uh, so when the campaign is live, I will go and post... Uh, our newsletter that the campaign is live. I will post on social media. I will change our uh, cover image everywhere from the website to all the social media uh, channels. I will go around to the different uh, Facebook groups and post that the game is live. Uh, follow this link. Uh, this is what the game is about. Once again, uh, please support us. <laughs> um, I will uh, post on Board Game Geek uh, both to the announcement but also to the forums. Uh, then hopefully I will have a lot of uh, <laughs> mails and uh, messages to reply to about uh, something that can help the project to, to be promoted. I'm not talking about uh, unsolicited uh, marketing agents which don't usually work. But I'm talking about perhaps somebody that wants to share something uh, and they have a question about like an image or so. Uh, so we, we always try to be um, preparing ahead a little bit. So we also have a Dropbox fo folder with uh, images that we send to press. So we also send a different newsletter to, to everybody who is uh, posting about games. So maybe they will repost about our campaign using the images that we shared with them. So in general, for the next 24 hours after your campaign is live, you have to get the word out because the first uh, two or three days are the most crucial of the campaign. Yeah, that sounds like a, that sounds like a busy first day. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's not just me that is doing that. Like I, I do take care of the newsletters, but uh, somebody else is uh, replying to the buckets that ask questions uh, in the first hours. Somebody else is posting on social media, perhaps. Somebody else is preparing the images that need to be prepared. 
maybe uh, some image in uh, some advertisement in uh, Facebook is not performing so well. So maybe we want to immediately change something like a word or maybe the link wasn't working. <laughs> maybe the image wasn't uh, clear enough in some devices. So we also try to double check everything that at least we are paying money or that we have our uh, brand on at, at the moment. So we want to make sure that we are uh, in control of the situation, but also uh, spreading the word. Yeah, that's, that's a big cohesive team effort for sure. <laughs> yeah. So for the rest of the campaign period, um, what kind of marketing things do you do? Because a lot of people, you know, they typically see that big spike at the beginning, um, a little bit of a lull and then a big spike towards the end. What happens during that, during that lull time? What kind of marketing do you guys do? Uh, yeah, the, the mid campaign slump is real. So you have to find ways to fight that. What we usually do is that, uh, if we have, for example, five reviews for our game, we don't have them all on day one. We have posted, uh, two or three of them on day one. Then we post another one after a week and then perhaps another one after the other week. Uh, also we try to have some other different content that we can share. So I want to post something every day. So I want to create something interesting enough to be posted every day. So maybe we have prepared some photos uh, that we will post a couple of days later. Maybe we have some interviews that we're going to post somewhere. Maybe we have scheduled uh, a live video talk uh, in some of our channels or we in, in a different uh, Facebook group. Maybe we have uh, a virtual play testing of the game somewhere. Uh, so we do try to create... Um, discussion about our product while the campaign is live and preferably in different uh, audiences as well. Uh, we don't want to focus on just one Facebook group or we don't want to do only Facebook advertisement. Uh, we try to engage with people that use more uh, forums like BoardGameGeek. Uh, we also know that a different audience uses Instagram than Facebook. So maybe uh, get some advertising that works better in uh, Instagram, especially. So we do try to diversify our uh, efforts and uh, to be present during the whole campaign. What I see to a lot of campaigns that have a great uh, mid-campaign slump is that they have all their efforts on day one. And then uh, if nothing great happens, like if your campaign does amazing, then you're great. Uh, you have stretch goals to post about. You have uh, a lot of people talking about your game because you already have a lot of backers. But if you have a campaign that is like uh, on 50% of funding, maybe you have 100 backers, maybe you have 200 backers, uh, maybe these backers are not really engaged yet, you have, at first, you have to try to engage them to discuss about your game uh, themselves and excite them about it. But also you have a lot of work to to create the content that you, you have to put out there. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense that you're diversifying your efforts and you're creating all this content to just kind of keep the conversation going about your game. What, you mentioned you, you tried different ads like for, for Instagram, maybe for Facebook, for board game geek. Can you tell us more about kind of the effectiveness of these, these channels? Uh, yeah. Facebook is uh, still working the best of us for us. Um, in every project, we spend at least 60% of our uh, ads revenue on, Insta on uh, Facebook. So uh, we do usually have a return of investment around four, three, or three to five times, depending on the campaign. So that means for every dollar that we give on Facebook, we'll have $5 in return. And from that, of course, you have to remove uh, uh, what you spend uh, on Kickstarter fees, on uh, on manufacturing the game, so it's not like five times a profit. Um, we also do board game geek ads depending on the game, and they also um, perform differently uh, according to the project. For example, I have seen that, for example, for Euro games, uh, board game geeks ads are great. For uh, game accessories, not so well. So I think in the last Coins campaign, we didn't do any board game geek uh, ads. Um, which we always did before. If we do a new game, we will definitely do it, especially if it's a game more uh, more more about strategy. 
Uh, other than that, in the past we have used uh, Google Ads, which um, haven't really worked great. They do have their purpose. For example, if you have a, a big uh, marketing budget, I would say that you, it's good to have face, um, Google Ads as well running along to create some extra traffic. Um, but nothing beats Facebook at the moment. Got it. Yeah, no, that's really good to know about, especially with Board Game Geek, how it only it typically works better for certain, you know, categories of games or products versus others. Yeah. Uh, also, we have spent some money advertising in um, different uh, websites. Uh, for example, uh, when we did our previous coins campaign, we did uh, an advertising in uh, Beast of War because they do have a, a big audience of uh, war games and uh, modelers who want to have premium uh, props. So they do use a lot of game accessories. So that also worked pretty well for us. But if I did a card game, for example, or a party game, I would never advertise it there. So you need to, to be certain that uh, what you're advertising, it is, it is interesting for the audience that you are advertising it for. Uh, and that's why Facebook is great, because Facebook allows you to change uh, the parameters and the audience that you want to, to target at. You can say that you want to target uh, only, I don't know, uh, women... 40 years old or older who are interested in uh, Pokemon. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> One example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you can do, uh, you can make an exact audience exactly how you want. You can uh, uh, use different interests, which is the main thing that you should use. Uh, you can use behaviors. You maybe want to uh, advertise to people that you have used uh, their credit card uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, you can do a lot of things with Facebook ads. Yeah, I, I love it. And so for, you mentioned you also use Facebook ads in the beginning of the uh, pre-launch part of the campaign too. What kind of like uh, distribution do you use? Is it like a 40% pre-launch, 60% during the campaign uh, budget wise? Uh, no, before the campaign, I try to create the traffic more organically. So through our uh, own social media presence, usually before the campaign starts, I spend 10 to 20% of our budget uh, as, as it goes in direct advertising, because we do like, uh, it costs to create prototypes, it costs to ship them to reviewers, it costs to pay the reviewers, but uh, this is a different uh, marketing budget in my mind. So from the advertising budget that we have, only on advertisement, it's about 20% of the budget. Got it. All right. That's really good to know. And so out of all these different marketing strategies, marketing tactics that you talked about for, for your campaign, from you know, talking about conventions to reviewers to emails to you know, organic marketing on, on social, social media, what do you think was kind of the most effective marketing method to getting people to know your project and come to your project and back to your project? Um, that's quite hard because, uh, everything helps everything else because if somebody sees you somewhere and then sees you somewhere else, uh, it's much more, uh, engaging to them. So if they have seen you on a convention, maybe they have seen people, uh, enjoying your game, your prototype, and, but they didn't have time to play it themselves. And then they see another about it online a week later, that's really effective. Um, so in your stats, you will see that you got like uh, an email subscriber from your advertising, but maybe they had already seen you uh, in SM, for example. Um, so it's not really easy to point out where the audience comes from. Uh, I like to think that everything that we do uh, and pay money and effort to be present at, everything helps us uh, get backers. So... Um, I guess my answer is from everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that um, is a real answer, right? Because I, I agree with your saying how everything kind of helps everything else. Like if you're if someone that sign a season ad somewhere and then they see you talking about your game, they're probably more interested in just joining the conversation or hearing what you have to say, just like you were talking about earlier too. Exactly. So, uh, for example, we just released our uh, a party game. Uh, it's called Alice in Wordland. And one of the selling points of the game is it has uh, a little teapot that uh, plays music. So we try to tease the game um, 
just by showing the teapot in various places. So uh, the image was imprint was shown to several uh, potential uh, backers. Uh, and then when they saw uh, the reviewers talking about a game that had a teapot, they remembered that, oh yeah, I have seen about it. Let me check what this is now. So uh, this is a, a real example of how you can use like uh, one type of uh, marketing to help you get somebody through a different type of marketing. I don't think that somebody who goes out there and just pays money to Facebook will have a successful campaign. You have to do a little bit of everything, but you have to focus most on what pays for you best. Uh, you will try some things. Maybe not everything works, or maybe you don't know what works exactly, but the thing that you see that's working for you, that's the thing that you need to to pay attention to. Uh, of course, getting advice from other people's experience helps, but every game can perform a little, a little bit differently. So you have to experiment. Yeah, that's, that's super important. The power of experimentation and understanding what works for your game and what works exactly. for your game. Yeah, so... You know, I, I really thank you for coming on the show and sharing with us all these insights about your campaigns and about marketing for all these, you know, more than 10 campaigns <laughs> that you've run before. <laughs> I know that the listeners will just really love what you have to say today. So thank you. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure. It's always, uh, I'm always happy to talk about our games or about uh, board gaming in general. So I'm very happy that I'm here talking about it. Sorry yeah. if I got carried away and... Uh, dominated this a little bit. I think I spent uh, too much of your time, but uh, it's always nice to talk. To talk. <laughs> it's wonderful. I love everything that you're saying. Um, and before we go, actually, I wanted to ask you, kind of what's next for Draw Lab Entertainment? Is it the new game that you just teased about just now? <laughs> Uh, yes, Alice is already out, so we, at the moment, it's not a great time to promote uh, a party game uh, in the age that there is no conventions or uh, social gatherings in many parts of the world. Uh, the next thing that we have is we do have a new uh, accessories campaign in September. Uh, it's going to be more about RPG fun, so if everybody is uh, into D&D, uh, make sure to stay tuned in our uh, Facebook page. Uh, and uh, before that, we are going to complete our uh, last game campaign, Fired Up, which uh, has been successfully funded. It's the biggest game uh, that we have done so far with lots of miniatures, uh, a lot of beautiful artwork by the Miko. So we're really excited to, to have this uh, in, uh, in the fall. That's awesome. And if listeners are interested in learning more about you and the game and your game you know, company, where, where should they head to? Uh, you can find us in uh, drawlab.com. That's our official website. Uh, we showcase everything that we do and we also post news there. So you can find and buy our games there. Uh, but you can also join us for a discussion in our Facebook uh, group of uh, Drawlab community or follow us as uh, Drawlab Entertainment in Facebook, Twitter or uh, Instagram. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you. It's been great. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Board Game Marketing Podcast. For daily tips and advice, find us in the Board Game Marketing Group on Facebook. See you next week.